that is ongoing work. Now let us move to the program that we have for this afternoon for the plenary. Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, our keynote speaker. Uh, James H. Simons is president of Renaissance Technologies Corp., a private investment firm dedicated to the use of mathematical methods. He was chair of the mathematics department at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, a professor of math at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and at Harvard University. Dr. Simons is the founder and chairman of Math for America, a nonprofit organization with a mission to improve math education in our nation's public schools. Uh, together with his wife, Marilyn, Dr. Simons manages the Simons Foundation, a charitable organization devoted to scientific research. Dr. Simon's remarks will focus on the importance of improving student achievement in math and how Math for America is engaged in that effort. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Simons. Well, thank you, Governor Napolitano, and I'm, I'm delighted and honored to be here. Uh, now, this gathering is uh, devoted to innovation and competitiveness, and I'm, I'm here to make the following proposition. Uh, the modern economy is increasingly based on math and science. We can't effectively compete in this new world unless our young people are well trained in these subjects. Regrettably, our public school teachers are increasingly deficient in their knowledge of these subjects. The only solution is to attract and retain new teachers who are not so deficient. This may be fairly easily accomplished by the standard approach. Make the job of teaching math and science more attractive. Now, I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes saying this all over again. <laughs> so I'll give you a little background on myself. I grew up in Massachusetts. Went to public school, had great teachers there, some good math teachers as well. I always wanted to be a mathematician for some reason, even when I was a little guy. I went to MIT. I graduated early, uh, spent one more year there in graduate school, and went off to Berkeley to get a PhD. Now, that was around 1958. In 1958, something very dramatic happened. Uh, Sputnik went up, and uh, that managed to terrorize uh, the whole country. Uh, it was perceived that we had a shortage of mathematicians and scientists. Our defense effort was falling behind, and something needed to be done. Well, it was done. So the National Defense Education Act was passed, uh, and other, uh, other programs were created. And these were meant, and indeed succeeded, in stimulating uh, a lot of young people to come into these fields. Uh, by a fluke, uh, I think, uh, I was the first person in America to get his Ph.D. under the National uh, Defense Education Act. And I got a nice letter from Abraham Ribikoff, who was the head of the HEW at that time and so on. But lots of guys followed. To give it a, a sense of how successful this program was, the year I got my Ph.D., 1961, there were fewer than 100 Americans who got Ph.D.s in mathematics. Ten years later, there were 1,400. Now, 1,400 was, uh, was a bit much. Uh, we didn't know how to place them all. But uh, nonetheless, it shows the power of a federal program. And indeed, uh, a lot more people, not only in mathematics, but physics and electrical engineering and all those fields uh, were, uh, were coming in. And we built up our effectiveness there. And uh, defense went pretty good. Uh, so I was a mathematical researcher. I spent 15 years uh, doing research in mathematics, if you can believe that, and teaching. Uh, some stuff named after me. I, I was reasonably successful. I had a good career there. I, I even won a, uh, won a prize. Uh, all my work was theoretical. Now, in the mid-'70s, for one reason or another, I, I uh, switched into finance. That was a pretty big jump. Uh, and while, it's, uh, as uh, Governor Politano said, we use mathematical methods, we didn't at first. I got into finance found uh, managing money uh, an interesting thing, uh, started what today is called a hedge fund. Uh, but uh, soon, uh, seat of the pants type investing and decision making didn't seem as, uh, uh, seemed it could be improved. And we began to bring in some mathematicians and scientists and build models. Uh, 
and then more people came in. We built more models, and the business got better and better. And uh, uh, over the years, uh, we've uh, been enormously successful and uh, made a ton of money, I have to confess. Uh, <laughs> so that was, uh, that was a long time. We even started giving some of it away, as, as Governor Politano mentioned. We, we, we have a charitable foundation devoted to basic research in math and science. My, my wife Marilyn over there is, uh, heads that foundation, and, and it's, it's been a pretty interesting career. Now, a lot has happened since Sputnik went up and the days of the National Defense Education Act. Uh, the world's whole economic engine now is, is uh, not just defense, is increasingly based on mathematics and science. You know, from Genentech to Google to Goldman, math and science is becoming king. By Goldman, of course, I mean Goldman Sachs. Now, there at Goldman Sachs, these scientific uh, types are called quants. Some of you may have heard of quants. But at Google, they're just called employees, because they're all quants, because they're all quants. They don't bother calling them quants at, uh, at Google. And that's, uh, that's a wave of the future. I think it's the wave of the future. Now, in 1958, we were clearly underprepared to compete in defense, and we got prepared. But now in 200, 2007, we may be underprepared to compete in anything, and that's of great concern. So, well, the U.S. is functioning. Uh, there are all these marvelous new jobs being created. Who's getting them? Well, who's, who's staffing these things? Well, I'll tell you, they are not, by and large, native-born Americans. The va vast majority of my own employees are from a whole panoply of foreign countries. Once in a while an American comes through the door, uh, but not so often. Uh, we use H-1 visas heavily to bring people in, and uh, we're not the only uh, uh, company to use H-1 visas because uh, there's a tremendous demand for them, as uh, many of you know. Uh, so we import people. Uh, the country, we don't, but the country also exports jobs in the sense of Indian software or Chinese hardware, all these things that are technology-based that for one reason or another we can't do in America. Now it's true, it's cheaper in India to get some with the right software, but it won't be forever. So how long can we continue doing this? How long can we continue being dependent on people coming in and work going out without falling behind from our leadership position. Now, well, what's the story with these people who keep coming in here? And with H Are they smarter than, than our folks? No, I don't think so. Sometimes I think so, but uh, then I calm down and realize that's not the case. Uh, but they're better trained. There's better trained without a doubt, because American schools are not doing their job. Now, everyone by now knows that by high school, U.S. kids rank near the bottom. I saw a list when I first started looking at this, and it was a long list of countries in the Western world and one thing or another, and we were the next to last. We weren't the last. Cyprus. Cyprus was the last. So uh, we at least beat out, uh, beat out Cyprus, and uh, Cyprus ought to pay attention to and do something, <laughs> and do something about their position on the list. But, uh, so this was a kind of a shocking thing. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, we're a very heterogeneous society and so on and so forth. We have a mixture of people bring down the average one thing or another. Well, guess what? It wasn't the case. Our top 10% weren't as good as their top 10%. It wasn't like this is a problem that only affects the disadvantaged and they bring. It's a problem for everybody everybody in our country were not being properly taught and were not being properly taught in our schools. So